counseling students. Here's what the research says. One out of every three girls, one out of every four boys, before they graduate from high school, will experience some form of sexual abuse. Let me say that again. One out of every three girls and one out of every four boys, before they graduate from high school, will experience some form of sexual abuse. That means in this class, every third or fourth person in here, probably, that would be part of your life experience. I remember uh, a good pastor friend of mine married his uh, uh, worship pastor, and uh, he's calling me like at midnight of the, of the night that he married them earlier that day, that Saturday. And his worship pastor called him in a panic. So they had gotten to where they were spending their first night as a couple. They had come up to the time that they were thinking and considering intimacy. And she had practically a panic attack because she had a pretty serious history of abuse. And the thought of disrobing, even in front of her now husband, whom she loved, produced such an anxiety in her, it really freaked her out. They never talked about it because of the shame associated with that. Now, something like that, you really might need a counselor to help unpack that. But those are important things. So all I'm saying about all these areas is that marriage or a significant relationship like that deserves and is worthy of the kind of investment to put into it to have the best chance to make it. Why? Why do I say that especially for us who are people of faith. Because I think marriage constantly faces attack. I think the enemy of our soul hates marriage. Why? Because if you look at Paul's discourse in Ephesians 5, talking about husbands and wives, and then at the end of that passage, he says, really, I'm talking about the mystery of Christ. Jesus as the bridegroom and the church, you as his bride. And so the devil hates that picture. And he'll do anything to destroy the image of God being a bridegroom and the church being a bride and tarnish what it means or how it's defined or how pure or holy it is. So especially for people of faith, you have a big bullseye on you. And I think we owe it to ourselves. We owe it to the people we fall in love with. And we owe it to the Savior to say this is a, this is a significant decision and Yes, we feel in love and all these things. Now let's do the work we need to do to really be honest and transparent and open up. Because, frankly, I promise you, you probably do a much, much better job talking about them after you say I do. Because there's nothing magical about walking down the altar. Pretty much who we are and what we see on this side of I do is pretty much who we are and what we see on that side of I do. Someone has an anger problem a month before getting married, good chance they're going to have an anger problem a month after getting married. Doesn't mean we don't change. God is transforming. I get all that. But it's great to invest in that. Amen? Is that good? Is this helpful? Good. I've shared my trauma with you. And so, let me see the time. 7 o'clock. Uh, let me take some questions, if any of you have any, and then I'll pass it back on to Chris. Anyone have any questions? Ask the therapist. I'm Dr. Phil. <laughs> yes. Can you say it loud, Doreen? Yes. What do you think is one of the greatest misconceptions that Christians have about dating? One of the greatest misconceptions that Christians have about dating. That's a great question. I'll get back to you on that. Um, well, you know, I think there, there could be potentially a number of misconceptions. You know, so different people have different views on this. Um, dating versus courting. And I know, I'll give you my own opinion, okay? I think dating is okay and it's natural. And it's like, you need some time to spend with another person just to see if you like them, if you enjoy their company, their presence. It doesn't mean the first time I go with someone, I have to determine and discern right then and there, is this the one? 
Are we compatible for marriage? Let's talk about this over dinner. Well, that'll probably be your first and only and last date with that person. <laughs> so dating for me is an opportunity to get to know somebody. But I do believe when you get to the point where you could say to yourself, I could envision myself falling in love with this person or maybe even moving to marriage, it wouldn't, it's not that far of a, uh, a stretch for me, then I think at that point, you or the couple should begin thinking about courting. And for me, courting is the time that you're really beginning to answer and figure out that answer to that question. Are we compatible? Is God calling us together? You know, could we see? I think so. Courting is beginning to evaluate that. I think if you're not feeling that, I think it, there's some potentially unhealthy things that can develop emotionally between people. When you go, I'm never going to marry this person, but I don't know how to pull apart from them. And again, certain times, certain uh, uh, things that some people have to recreate other earlier dynamics or there's codependency or stuff, I need to fix this person. We stay in relationships perhaps longer than we should, you know, even though it may not be healthy. So I think every relationship probably starts with friendship and dating, you're spending time. But I don't think you date someone forever if you can't, especially if you've made that decision, you understand in your heart, is this a, a real possibility or not? Good question. What else? Don't be shy. Yes. One more time, real loud. Is there an ideal formalism for the money uh, type of marriage relationships that this problem is impacting? Is there an ideal formula for the way a couple might handle money before getting married or in marriage? Is that the question? In marriage. Um, I, I don't know if there is an ideal way. I, I have seen in a marriage that sometimes one of the two is better at managing money and paying bills. I think the key is, are you together and communicating in, in agreement about whatever the plan is? I understand that, especially in two-income couples, it's like, I, I, here's, the, here's my view. It's like, this is not yours, mine. Don't start relationships, if you're moving toward marriage, on mine, yours. Ours. Ours to steward together for God. And so I say, make decisions together, but if you're both working and you both have income, come on. It, it, it give yourselves each some mad money, if your budget allows for it. The, you've worked hard, allow that. I think that the key on, on money is to make decisions together, not by fiat or um, independently. And so there are many ways that that can work out. It's like if the couple agrees and believes that and they're both okay with it, then for the most part within the um, relationship, it's gonna be okay. What happens is that couples don't talk about money and it becomes a sore spot because it becomes a his and her kind of dynamic, which is not healthy, especially if both are working. You know, I've never, um, my, my Donna was in school to be a nurse. Um, we made a decision to start a family. She did go through a number of miscarriages uh, we adopted twins. Um, she uh, pretty much was a homemaker, and I'd never say she didn't work, believe me. Um, but at the same time, she's never actually drawn a paycheck for a good chunk of our marriage. I've never seen it as my money. This is for us to steward together. We have to make this together. We're going to be accountable to God together for what he gave us. And so I think just, yeah, that's a healthy way to look at it. Another question. Yes, sir. How do you move past the friend zone? Well, it didn't work to say, may I kiss you? <laughs> well, I think, I think it's okay if you've been spending some time together. I don't know if there's a, I don't think you can say, after seven dates, you must ask the following three questions. I, I don't, 
I, I think every couple's a little bit different. Like the couple sitting next to normal. <clears throat> I want to embarrass someone I work with. I think every couple's different, but I do think I do think that you should talk about you might say, be honest and say, I'm feeling that this may turn more into a friendship. And if the other person isn't there, you can say, do you think it could? Well, maybe. Then you say, okay, I'm not where you are, but let's keep spending time together. If the other person says, you know, frankly, I'm not sure I'll ever see it that way. Well, that's a clue. <laughs> and if you both say, well, yeah, I think so, and I'm feeling the same thing, well, then that helps you understand, well, maybe I'm not going to date more than one or go out with more than one person right now we're going to see what God is speaking to us about this relationship so I think the key is to have communication and be transparent without putting pressure on a person because you always want to give freedom in a relationship for people to say no as much as you want them I mean, you might hope and pray they say yes but you know if someone's not where you are in terms of timing or uh, the level of commitment, I think you have to give them the space. Pressure rarely, um, you know, facilitates something good in a, in a relationship, yes? Do you ever think that um, one is better than the other in terms of it's better to be friends first before you make it apparent that you like each other and decide to pursue that? Or if it's okay to just like each other right when you right off the bat? Well, whether the, the question was, do you think it's good to be friends first before you decide that maybe you like each other a lot? Yeah. Um, yeah. I think whether it's something that you say, should we be friends first or later? Listen, sometimes, let's be honest, I am physically attracted to you. You caught my attention. Okay, there's nothing inherently wrong with that. By the way... God is very attracted to you. Read the Song of Solomon. He said, one glimpse from you causes my heart to beat faster. That's pretty attractive. So there's nothing wrong with that as long as it doesn't go ahead of what God has. But whether that is sort of what catches your eye and you begin spending time together, I'll say it again. Any lasting, healthy, balanced marriage is based on an absolute, rock-solid friendship. And so whether it starts that way, get there. Become friends. Be pals. Enjoy each other's company for the sake of that one day you may journey together in a lot of ways. You know, does it have to be, well, you know, let's do the chess club together for, or, you know, or let's, I mean, maybe, maybe not. I, I, I don't think, that's just it. I don't think you can put God or relationships in a box like that. I think there's some parameters and some principles to pay attention to, but I think every couple is unique, a little different. Yes, sir. The question is, you're sent. <laughs> we need to have a private meeting. Actually, <laughs> uh, the question was, you know, especially for men who maybe at least culturally sometimes the expectation is put on you to um, sort of ask the woman's parents for their blessing, uh, or how do we pursue that? Uh, what do we do if the response is less than enthusiastic, or maybe even no? <laughs> Now, I, I think it, it. I think having a parent's blessing is important. In some cultures, it's it's significantly a uh, bigger issue. Okay, I, I get that. Um, you know, I think if you're talking about two adults who are capable of making adult decisions and capable of being led by the Lord, I think you can be led by the Lord as a couple. Now, having said that, I also understand that family members may not always feel the same way. Okay, I have a very close colleague who um, um, this is a, would 